foot charm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at West Alameda Community Baptist Church, the Church at Eaton. Many of you have probably noticed Sharon is not with us uh, this morning. She received word that her grandmother was very ill in Utah on Friday, and so <coughs> she uh, asked to be able to head out and, and see her grandmother this weekend, so of course. So we'll be doing a little bit of a uh, variety show today. Uh, Kathy Hammer was the male voice, and I can certainly play the hymns and do some other music. And Jeannie agreed to come and <coughs> fill in the blanks for when I'm at the piano. So. We appreciate your patience and know you continue to offer your prayers for Sharon as well. Just a few other announcements as we begin worship. Uh, an ongoing invitation to join us for Talkback. We really are having a good discussion of the Lord's Prayer. Um, taking it petition by petition, line by line, and, and going through it and really learning a lot, I think. Um, feel free to join us even if you haven't been there for the first few weeks of that. And we have coffee and donuts. And cookies too. Uh, and an invitation as well for Bible study. Uh, again, a great group. We're having wonderful discussions. Thursday at 3 o'clock, we're in the Gospel of John. Uh, feel free to just join us and try it out. I think you'll, you'll uh, find uh, a good group and a pleasant occasion to learn more about our scriptures. Next week is Palm Sunday. I know. Time flies. Even though Easter is almost as late as it can be this year, uh, it still seems to sneak up on me anyway. But uh, this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday. We'll, of course, have our palms available and do our traditional kind of waving palms for the opening hymns and those kinds of things. And, and uh, sharing, uh, sharing some important scriptures. Uh, traditionally, Palm Sunday is the Sunday that the Passion narratives are read that, that talk about the crucifixion. And we'll do some of that as well next Sunday. <clears throat> the sermon is entitled Paid in Full. I encourage you to join us for that. Um, our April church board meeting is this Friday at 10 o'clock in the fireside room. Uh, everyone is welcome. The board will receive a packet on their door uh, with the uh, materials for the board meeting this week. But anyone is welcome to attend that. If you're interested in attending that and want to receive that packet, let me know. Otherwise, you're welcome to just show up Friday at 10 in the fireside room and see what this powerful group does. Lynn's laughing. She's chair of that powerful group, and she's laughing. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, I invite you to take a moment, take a breath, center your, your heart and your mind on Christ, and hear these words from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. Amen. Let's pray. O oh, loving, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather in this holy hour, we pray that your spirit would be present among us, leading and guiding our worship. May the words we hear and speak the songs we hear and sing, the prayers we offer, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am so sad that Sharon can't be with us, but what a joy that Jim gets to share his gift with us. Yeah. Um, just stand if you wish for the. Um, I'm sorry. Microphone. Closer? Better? Yes. Okay. Um, you can remain seated for the call to worship and the words will be on the screen as well as in your bulletin. image. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I think one of the most important reasons we're here this morning is our prayer time. Concerns for our neighbors, our friends, and joys as well. But I picked up an old bulletin yesterday, and I confess, I hardly ever read those titles. I hope Jim didn't hear me. <laughs> but I have to read this one. It's from, like I said, an old bulletin. Prayer, a time of drawing on spiritual strength. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry reached his ears. Psalm 18.6. Isn't that beautiful? That just encourages me to continue my own prayer time as well as this prayer time. In our community, Polly Allen is at Lutheran. And if anybody knows differently, please let us know. Bill Hale is at St. Anthony. We continue to have prayers for Barb, Barb Kleinman and Elizabeth Rojas. And we are continuing to pray for Doris Doza Deli's family and friends in her death last week. Her service will be next Sunday, the 10th, at 3 o'clock here in the Centrum. We also pray for Sharon's parents and Sharon and her grandmother that these health concerns will be rectified. We pray for Rod Smith's neighbor Mark and Janice. We pray for Ronnie Zeiss. Um, her fan, she has a family member Mark as well as some friends Eddie and Darlene with health, health concerns. You know, there's so much suffering in this world, but especially right now in Ukraine. And I honestly think there's a lot of people in Russia who are very, very concerned about this situation. So we offer our prayers for many countries in conflict. I pray for the, the neighbors of those countries who are welcoming refugees, who are um, surrounding them with love and prayer. We continue to pray for all COVID situations, even though ours is lessening a little bit. We don't want to say it too loudly. <laughs> um, and most of all, peace. Peace in our world with love and respect for each other, that we reflect God's love and mercy and grace. Are there any additions? Rod. Yeah, please pray for her, Benita. She hurt her back yesterday at work. She wanted to be here this morning, but she's not doing well. Well, extend our love and prayers to her. D. Prayers for my sister and Bill. We'll do. Continue prayers for um, Dee's sister and family. Any others? Let's remain seated while we sing our call to prayer, sweet hour of prayer. we've spoken and the ones that are deep down in our hearts.
Gracious Lord, we come to you with humble hearts, in awe of your unconditional love, your presence everywhere we are, especially as we return to worshiping together. Thank you that we can come before you with those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. We ask that same presence for those who are in need of healing of many kinds, be it in health, spirituality, and the physical aspects of life. For those who are dealing with monetary issues, we ask for your guidance. Help us spend less energy in our attempts to be in control, realizing you want us to trust you, to pray, to let go. Give us ears to hear your promptings to intercede and the will to obey. We pray for our world where unrest and division reside. We pray for peace. We pray for our nation experiencing differences of opinion along with fears for our future. We pray for assurance. We pray for our Eaton community as we return to what we hope will be normal once again. We cautiously step out to public life, to grocery stores, to Eaton activities. We pray for hope. We pray for our families that they will know you and your love. Being able to trust you with all their concerns, we pray for acceptance. We also thank you for the joys that lift us up in our lives. We are grateful, Lord, for this church. The light still shines. We are your beacon. Guide us and direct us to reach out with love to those around us. Help us to understand how to love even the unlovable. May we remember the infinite possibilities that are born of our faith in you. Help us to use the gifts you have given and to pass on the love that you demonstrate. May we be content with ourselves just the way we are, just the way you have made us. Be with us as we stumble through this chaos called life in this world we live in today. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to picture with me a scene of, we've seen so often, two men stranded on a desert island. A small island, just one palm tree growing up the middle. And they're concerned. The one guy is panicked. He said, we're going to starve to death. There's no water. The other guy said, don't worry. My pastor will find me in the next 24 hours. I said, wow. You really have an amazing pastor. He said, well, it's not that so much. You see, I make about $100,000 a week and I tithe. So I know he'll find me in the next 24 hours. <laughs> well... I promise I'd do my best to find you on a desert island, <laughs> whether or not you make $100,000 a week or whether or not you tie it. So often we think that, that we come to worship and we offer our songs and, and our offering is the price of admission. That's not what the offering is about. Our offering is our chance to take a moment and remember how much God has blessed us give thanks for those blessings and to consider how God is calling us to share our time, our talents, our resources to bless our world. It's in that spirit I invite our ushers forward as we receive this morning's offering.
You tell me don't do this every weekend on order. I came over here for the scripture reading. We're not there yet. Jeannie, I'll go ahead and introduce the, uh, the hymn of preparation. Okay. <laughs> we enter in the time in our worship service where we open our hearts and minds to hear and receive God's word. I invite you to remain seated. Let's sing together our hymn of preparation. You'll find it on the inserts in your bulletin. You know the words are on the screen as well. Let's remain seated and sing together. Fill my cup. second chapter of Luke, verses 14 to 20. When the hour came, he took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, as we approach your throne, we seek to hear your word and will for our lives. Open our hearts and minds, God, that we may be your children in this place. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. A scene unfolded in 2008 on uh, New Zealand's Mahaya Beach that stunned everyone who saw it, saw it happen. And, and millions of people over the next few days who saw the video of the scene broadcast in news reports all around the world. 
It seems two sperm whales, a mother and her calf, had gotten themselves stranded, stuck on a submerged sandbar just offshore. That happens occasionally down there, and, and the, the results are usually tragic. But as always, good-hearted people piled into boats to do what they could. They attempted to tie ropes around the whales and pull them off the sandbar, but to no avail. Some scuba divers went down to try to excavate around the whales, trapped bodies to see if they could free them that way, but that didn't work either. Malcolm Smith, New, Ze uh, New Zealand conservation officer who was overseeing the rescue efforts, resigned himself to what he was sure would be the, the inevitable death of those two magnificent creatures. He informed the dozens of volunteers who had come out to do what they could to help that it was time to stop their efforts. And then off in the distance, Almost like a, a comic book hero appeared a figure that was familiar to the folks who spent time on the beach of Mahaya. Up swam Moko, an exceptionally large bottle-nosed male dolphin who often spent his days swimming around with and entertaining those enjoying a day on the beach there. Now bottle-nosed dolphins are known for their intelligence and, and, and they frequently interact, sometimes to their detriment, with human beings. But Moko was special. For one thing, he was unusually large. He was 10 feet long and weighed an estimated 250 pounds. But he was also exceptionally friendly and, and very social. In fact, he apparently preferred to spend his days hanging around the folks at the beach instead of with other dolphins. And he, he didn't even seem to follow the typical migration patterns. He hung around there all year round. On that day in 2008, whether he was attracted by the commotion and the activity or, or this gathering of people out there by the sound bar or who knows, maybe a sense of duty he felt to his fellow sea mammal cousins, those sperm whales, he showed up with a bit of fanfare of his own making, those squeaks and squawks that dolphins are known for. After a few laps around the stranded whales and the boats nearby, and maybe just showing off a bit for those human onlookers, he approached the two whales. He seemed to almost communicate with them. And then swimming back and forth, he managed to guide them to freedom away from their sandy death trap. The humans broke out in applause. The whales swam away without even so much as a thank you. And Moko was reported to have taken kind of a bow and a victory lap, who knows, as she headed back to the beach to hang out with her friends there. For his efforts, Moko was recognized as the unofficial recipient of the eighth place on the list of amazing animal rescuers. Conservation Officer Smith was pleased with that recognition, but, but felt that Moko deserved to be ranked even higher than that. After all, it was an interspecies rescue, he pointed out. And rescue was the term that was used by onlookers and the media to describe Moko's heroics. The Bible uses what I think is a better term for a situation like that, deliverance. For a Jewish person, both in Jesus' day and today, the most important event in their faith is the exodus from Egypt. That moment when God sees that his chosen people are no longer welcome guests in Egypt the, as they were in Jacob and Joseph's day. Back then, the descendants of Abraham were refugees from a catastrophic famine in that promised land. But within a couple of centuries, they had become slaves. Second-class residents in the land now feared by their one-time gracious hosts because of their increasing numbers and their physical strength. While they wanted their labor, they feared their prospering. So in Moses' days, you might remember, they even increased the oppression and, and even issued an edict calling for the slaughtering of all the male babies that were born to the Jewish people. God sees the situation and, and using Moses, he is determined to rescue this beloved people, bring them out of bondage in Egypt and return them to the land that he had promised Abraham that his descendants would inhabit always. But it goes beyond rescue, it's deliverance. 
not only saving people from danger, but restoring them to the good life that they're meant to have. It's no wonder that one of the names that Jews still use for God is Yahweh Mephalti, God the Deliverer. Given that this exodus, this deliverance is the pivotal moment in Jewish history, it's, it's also no wonder that the most important holiday festival in their year is Pesach. We know it as Passover. It's a time to remember the events surrounding what ended up being a 40-year process of returning to the Promised Land, the calling of that reluctant Moses to lead the whole thing, the plagues that were visited on Pharaoh to convince him to, quote, let my people go. That hurried exit out of Egypt before the bread had even had a chance to rise. The struggle and the sacrifice and the tears of the ordeal and the sweetness of that ultimate homecoming to the promised land. Many of you, I think, have probably been a part of a modern-day Passover meal. It's called the Seder these days, either in your church or perhaps hosted by a Jewish friend or neighbor. You know then it's a meal that's filled with symbolism and ritual, but with two main components, two main purposes, then in Jesus' day and today as well. It's to remember and give thanks for those events. Give thanks to God the Deliverer. And it's designed to teach the children who are present about this momentous event in their faith history. And it's looking in on that meal taking place in an upper room in Jerusalem that we find ourselves as we hear the scripture lesson that Don gave us from Luke. The form is slightly different from what you might find today. But the main elements are the same. Scripture readings and prayers that invoke remembrance and gratitude, surrounded by food that is symbolic, with connections to the story, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, sweet honey and fruit, and at the heart of it, the Passover lamb. Bringing to mind God's grace and forgiveness, in old days looking forward to this ultimate lamb of God that was promised who would take away the sins of the world, and we, through the gospel accounts, are privileged to see that promised Lamb of God actually presiding at the meal, Jesus Christ. The Son of God, the promised Messiah, who in just a few hours will die on the cross to pay the cost of our sins and transgressions for the whole world. Those present that evening, yes, the 12 disciples, but more than likely many others too, important people in Jesus three-year ministry, probably including many of the women whose works and generosity made his mission possible. Those gathered don't seem yet to understand all that's going on, those words that Jesus gives us. Jesus transforms the meal as he uses it to institute, to usher in the new covenant of grace and salvation that's promised by God from the Old Testament, from ancient days. The themes of deliverance and remembering are still at the heart. In Luke's version, we see Jesus using the drinking of the first of four ceremonial cups of wine that are part of that meal to remind those there that, that the events that will unfold are those that will make the kingdom of God that he spent three years proclaiming possible. Then he takes the bread. It would have been unleavened in this meal. And the transformation, the offering to us begins. He says... This bread is my body. Remember me. Remember what I have done with you. Remember what I have done for you. He's saying that to those present and to all who will follow at the table. Remember. Luke then turns to the final of those four symbolic cups of wine as Jesus uses the symbolism of the wine to initiate the new covenant and to remind us all of the grace poured out for us as he bled and died on the cross. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Verse 20, and he says, remember me. Remember. The Passover meal is transformed into the celebration of communion for us, of coming together and remembering another deliverance, our deliverance from separation from God, separation from one another, separation from Great separation from eternal fellowship and love. I need to take just a moment here and put on my Protestant preacher's hat. <laughs> Over the centuries, far too much speculation and superstition has arisen from the words and in this whole celebration. 
There are branches of Christianity who believe that the bread that we receive actually becomes the physical body of Christ, that the wine, that unfermented grape juice that we receive, actually becomes Christ's blood as we receive it in the Eucharist. The Greek words really don't go there. If we were to minutely, technically translate them, it would be something along the line of this bread signifies, this bread symbolizes my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. And that makes sense. After all, Jesus is right there with them, present physically, not in the bread, but with them next to them. But on the other side, we Protestants often downplay Christ's presence with us when we come to the table. Christ is present with us as we receive the bread and wine and we remember. Over the years, I've seen communion bring tears of gratitude and joy to the eyes of people in the darkest moments in their lives as they taste the bread and drink the cup of blessing. I've seen beloved brothers and sisters in Christ receive communion as almost or as their last physical act in this life. They receive, they remember, and they are blessed. It's meant to be a, a holy moment, a joyful time, and I hope that this morning and whenever we receive these gifts of bread and wine, we remember that. You see, God understands that we need tangible, tangible, physical reminders of His grace and love. Our lives bury us in worry and fear and cares, and our culture buys for our attention and our hearts with things that, if I were to quote the hymn of preparation, we just sang, things that do not satisfy. God knows that. So in Christ, He left the church with two of those reminders, physical reminders, baptism and communion. Some churches call them ordinances, some call them sacraments, but no matter what the label, they are gifts from God. Ordinary things, water and bread and wine, that we hear and we feel and we taste, and we remember, and we give thanks. Some of you who know hymns may have noticed that almost every month during communion, Sharon plays that hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together While We're Receiving the Bread and the Juice. When I first came here, she asked me if it was okay if she played that every month. And I assured her not only was it okay, it was perfect. The story behind that favorite communion hymn is one of a people who in the midst of, of incredible pain and suffering knew the joy, the remembrance, the gratitude that were to be found when they gathered together and heard and responded to Christ's invitation to the table. As they gathered in the darkness of night under the threat of beating or even death if they were discovered. But still, in that holy time together, their spirits were strengthened, their faith was renewed, they remembered, and they give thanks. Most of you probably know that hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together, is actually an Afro-American spiritual. It was written by American slaves in the 1800s, and it was sung as they gathered at night to worship and together receive communion. And they probably hummed it without words as they toiled in the heat of the day to remember. The words remind us that we break bread together, we drink wine together, we praise God together, and in the final verse that's usually not sung anymore, we will all sing together on that day. That day when Christ returns as he promised in this morning's scripture even. And we all feast together at that great kingdom banquet. So we join with the great throngs of, of gathered witnesses from 2,000 years of faith. We join with those saints who have gone before, before us and, and we look forward to those who will come after us. All those who have heard Christ's call to faith and redemption, who have heard and responded to Jesus' invitation to come to the table. We gather and we give thanks for our God who created us and knows us better than we know ourselves, who loves us better than anyone else can ever love us, who came to us in Jesus Christ to walk our walk and share our journey to be like us, and then by his sacrifice to save us, to deliver us. We do this in remembrance of him. Amen.
Please stand, if you wish, for our closing hymn, You Feed Us, Gentle Savior. Gracious and loving God, we leave this hour of time together, a fellowship of worship, to go forth into the world. And as we do, God, we ask that you light our paths and guide our footsteps. Give us hearts to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.